I most earnestly, humbly, and seek to be sustained by the Spirit as I endeavor to discuss an important and sensitive subject. I approach it with all the humility and with the profound respect that it commands. I have chosen to speak on the sanctity of life. I desire also to speak with reverence about the hallowed hallmark of life, which is the ability to reproduce itself. I wish also to be an advocate for the unborn. For this reason, I direct my remarks primarily to women because only they can honor the holy calling of motherhood, which is the most exalted good that can be rendered to mankind. In the Talmud we read, He who saves one life is as if he had saved an entire world. Since the beginning of man, God has taught of an absolute respect for human life. From the very first moment of his being until the last breath of his life, there is a veneration for life which includes those in being but not yet born. One wise teacher tells us, One human life is as precious as a million lives, for each is infinite in value. The exercise of a man or a woman's sacred procreative powers makes each a partner with God in creation and brings to them in parenthood their greatest happiness. This divine partnership also brings their greatest privileges and most weighty responsibilities. Since becoming a parent is such a transcending blessing, and since each child is so precious and brings so much happiness, a cardinal purpose of marriage and life itself is to bring forth new life within this partnership with God. Obligations inherent in the creation of precious human life are a sacred trust which, if faithfully kept, will keep us from degenerating into moral bankrupts and from becoming mere addicts of lust. The responsibilities involved in the divine life-giving process and the functions of our body are so sacrosanct that they are to be exercised only within the marriage relationship. Those who do not accept and meet those responsibilities for any reason as well as those who do, should never depart from the law of chastity if they wish to be truly happy. All members of this Church seeking eternal joy and peace are expected to and will wish to come to the marriage altar free from sexual transgressions, chaste and pure. Any who fail to do so may find that they have cheated themselves of their own self-respect, dignity, and much of the great joy they seek in marriage. Because of the special inner peace, strength, and happiness it brings, chastity, as the law of God is and always has been, really in, and unchastity is and always has been, really out. In times past, we have looked upon a person who saves another human life as a great hero. Yet now we have come to a time when the taking of an unborn human life for non-medical reasons has become tolerated made legal and accepted in many countries of the world. Because it may be legal to destroy newly conceived life will never make it right. It is consummately wrong. President Spencer W. Kimball has recently said, This is the most despicable of all sins, to destroy an unborn child to save one from embarrassment or to save one's face or comfort. Some say, as did the Supreme Court of the United States, that it is only a theory that human life is present from conception. This is contrary to insurmountable medical evidence. Dr. Bernard N. Nathanson recently revealed that he was among those who were militantly outspoken in favor of legalized abortion and joined in using every device available in political action to promote it. He helped set up and became director of the first and largest clinic abortion clinic in the Western world. After the center had performed some 60,000 abortions, Dr. Nathanson resigned as director. He said, I am deeply troubled by my own increasing certainty that I, in fact, presided over 60,000 deaths. There is no longer serious doubt in my mind that human life exists within the womb from the very onset of pregnancy. Way back in the 16th century, Arandius showed that maternal and fetal circulations were separate, thus clearly demonstrating that there are two separate lives involved. The unborn babe is certainly alive because it possesses the token of life, which is the ability to reproduce dying cells. For the unborn, only two possibilities are open to it. 
It can become a live human being or a dead unborn child. Dietrich Benhofer, referring to the unborn babe in the mother's womb, said, The simple fact is that God certainly intended to create a human being. Because she feels it, every mother knows there is sacred life in the body of her unborn babe. There is also life in the spirit, and sometime before birth the body and the spirit are united. When they do come together we have a human soul, for the Lord has said, and the spirit and the body are the soul of man. Experts tell us that the necessity of terminating unborn life is rarely justified for purely medical or psychiatric reasons. Some justify abortions because the unborn may have been exposed to drugs or disease and may have birth defects. Where in all the world is the physically or mentally perfect man or woman? Is life not worth living unless it is free of handicaps? Experience working with handicapped children suggests that human nature frequently rises above its impediments and that in Shakespeare's words, best men are molded out of faults and for the most become much better for being a little bit bad in the physical sense. Many parents who have known the heartache and concern of a handicapped child would agree with Pearl Buck, Nobel Prize winning author, who said, A retarded child, a handicapped person, brings its own gift to life and even to the lives of normal human beings. What a great gift to life, to mankind, the life of Helen Keller brought. It is the belief of those who are members of this Church that human life is so hallowed and precious that there is an accountability to God on the part of those who invoke the sacred fountains of life. The destruction of such a treasure is so abhorrent that the First Presidency of the Church have clearly and repeatedly counseled, as did President Kimball this morning, against the taking of unborn life. I quote, Abortion must be considered one of the most revolting and sinful practices in this day. Members of the Church, guilty of being parties to the sin of abortion, must be subjected to the disciplinary action of the councils of the Church as circumstances warrant. Members are counseled neither to submit to or perform an abortion except in the rare cases where it is medically necessary, and as the First Presidency have further counseled, even then it should be done only after counseling with local presiding priesthood authority and after receiving divine confirmation through prayer. The First Presidency have advised that it will be amenable to the laws of repentance and forgiveness. It is my feeling that we grossly underestimate the sacred nature of motherhood. Psychiatric experts remind us that there are certain fundamental biological facts which influence the psyche of those who bring new life into the world. One says, the ability of mothers to accept infants after they are born is underrated and underestimated. Childbearing is a basic biological and psychological privileged function of womankind. One of the most evil myths of our day is that a woman who has joined hands with God in creation can destroy that creation because she claims the right to control her own body. Since the life within her is not her own, how can she justify its termination and deflect that life from an earth which it may never inherit? The great medical profession for which I have such great respects who for centuries has been committed to the preservation of life under the cardinal principles of treatment, do no harm and protect life, now finds itself destroying almost a million unborn children a year in the United States alone. Each of these, because of tiny chromosomal differences, would have been different from any other person born in the world. How many with special gifts like unto Moses or Leonardo da Vinci and Abraham Lincoln might have been among them? These and all others are entitled to a defense in their unborn natural state of existence. One great physician says, we do that much for seagulls, flamingos, and whooping cranes. This same physician, Dr. Henry D. G. Armitage, Jr., states, not without comment shall it come to pass that a state so fretful for the praying, preservation of the praying mantis but holding an unborn babe to be of no account can send a spark of immortality swinging out into limbo and conspire with citizens and physicians to turn a fragile living object of simple innocence and complex wonder into a pathetic pulp and consign it by rude and peremptory passage to the furnace or sewer 
unknown, unwanted, and undefended. He further questions how women, as the fertile adornment of our race, can be deluded into the notion that she is a mere portress of unwanted luggage, or be by blandishment seduced into believing that she has dominion over life her own. He says, an abortion is never commonplace, for world, the world holds no heartbreak like the death of innocence. Whenever and wherever it occurs, we all suffer a loss from that little which sustains us and holds us together. It is the degradation of humanity. It is fullness emptied, innocence defiled, song unfinished, beauty discarded, hope unsprung. In our absence, housebreakers are robbing us of everything that we own, of virtue, honor, integrity, trust, innocence, truth, beauty, justice, and liberty." Unquote. I urge all who may have dipped into the fountains of life to respect, respect the divinity inherent in that life and to protect this sacred treasure and its transcending blessings. For the Savior of the world said, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto the least of these, ye have done it unto me. I leave my testimony that the most precious of all of God's creations is eternal life itself. In the sacred name of Jesus Christ, amen.